let's shift gears from synchronicity to online payment startups. It's a big shift, but uh, check out. Let's uh, make it easier for businesses to process and take payments over the web after raising its latest round of funding this year. It's now one of the most valuable fintech startups in Europe. The founder and chief executive officer, Guillaume Poussaz, says uh, that he will take us through his journey of building his rocket ship company. Moderating the discussion will be Tom Stafford, managing partner at DST Global. Let's now join Tom and Guillaume for their Founders Story episode focusing on Checkout. Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Stafford, managing partner of DST Global. We are an internet and technology firm investing all over the world. And I have a great pleasure in introducing Guillaume Poussaz, founder and CEO of Checkout.com. And thank you to Singapore FinTech Festival for having us here today. So Guillaume, uh, let's start with a run through of what Checkout.com is, what you do, what products and services you offer. Hi, Tom. So first, thanks for having me. Um, Checkout is an, an, a cloud-based payments platform. We service basically enterprises. Uh, it's always been the focus for us. And we, we did this basically by disintermediating the entire value chain in payments. So, I mean, historically, uh, payments are built across a payment gateway that connects, you know, the website and the app to the bank, the bank, and then the platform behind it. Uh, we basically built everything ourselves. We're doing this across 40 countries now. Um, and basically, a service, you know, fintech companies like Revolut, uh, TransferWise, um, Klarna, but also like the Grabs and Farfetch of the world. Um, it's 1,400 um, customers and about 1,000 uh, employees globally at this point. And Kian, what's pretty unusual about the checkout story, of course, is that you were bootstrapped for the first many years of, of, of the company. And um, maybe talk us through a little bit about uh, what, what being bootstrapped meant for, for checkout, both in your history, but also what it's meant today and going forward for you as a company. So I think we always had discipline at our core. I mean, uh, the company is mostly engineering. This is something that is pretty, uh, I'd say, unusual is that, you know, I was saying we're a fintech company with a financial services arm, but about two thirds of the company is product and engineering. And the reality is that for us, uh, discipline was really in our DNA. It was embedded. And I think like for many years, and I mean, you probably know this as, as one of our investors, but we were doing no marketing. So it was all about finding the product market fit, building these three different layers, because we saw this as the only way and the only, you know, really uh, uh, opportunity to really offer good services to merchants. If you have different pieces of technology that talk to each other, you're not able to, you know, follow the, the pace of innovation into payments. And especially now when there are so many alternative payment methods, Visa and MasterCard are very active. You got Alipay, WeChat Pay, Union Pay. So basically that discipline was really embedded in every single decision we were making, how we were scaling the business. And fundamentally, um, it was really like, you know, a, a silver lining in every single decision we made. Um, I think like still to this day, you know, we're very proud to be a profitable fintech. We think it's important, especially if you deal with regulators. Um, and I think it's just, a, it's a good exercise. But you did change your your your, your decision in, in essence. In 2019, you raised your first outside capital. And indeed, within 12 months, you raised your second round. And, and those two rounds combined were, were pretty large, about $400 million totally raised. So what so made you... Of, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Ahead. I was no, going to say, what ah, made sorry, you change? I think you have to re-ask that question. Like, we're like, this one we're going to get out. Sorry. Okay. No, not at all. My fault, Kyo. So... Um, so, Guillaume, you, you did kind of change your, 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 your perspective a little bit. In 2019, you, you raised your first round of capital uh, uh, and indeed within 12 months raised a second round of capital and totaled $400 million in that time period. What was it that kind of led you in 2019 to decide to, to take external capital? So basically what happened is that we really reached the product market fit at the end of 2016 when we had really rebuilt everything. That was basically a four-year journey. Uh, and from there on, we had, you know, like the first merchants going onto the platform, the really big ones. And in 2018, we signed one of the largest internet companies globally. Um, this for us was like more than just like, you know, product market fit. It was like validation straight from the Silicon Valley. And at that point in time, we kind of really realized that when you've signed this company, then everyone else is basically possible. And I think, you know, I mean, uh, as a CEO, I've always had that very kind of humble approach that you need to better yourself, yourself every day. Uh, and fundamentally, I had never built a thousand people company and certainly not a 5,000 people company. Basically, we're taking the company in the next few years. So we decided to really kind of surround ourselves with like really smart investors that could basically make us better. I think that was really the idea. When you raise capital, you need to write, a, I guess, an equation of value, what you're trying to achieve. 
And in 2018, it became obvious that we had it, you know, to surround ourselves with like, you know, good investors. And fundamentally, we put that in motion in 2019. And it was a success uh, after that. And, and do you think when you look back now um, that there's, you know, w- would it have been better to raise earlier, do you think? I've always said that my biggest mistake was to not raise one year sooner uh, half the money with a single investor. But I think you cannot kind of remake history. Uh, and fundamentally, you know, we're very happy with the investors that we have. They've been instrumental to our success. You know, we've always had a very good product. But certainly, you know, again, being humble to the task that is in front of you is very important. And having people that can steer you and, you know, help you and mentor you is, is definitely a plus to any entrepreneur. So, so you just mentioned product, Guillaume. So let, let's switch to that for a second. I mean, online payments is, you know, it's already a large market. There's lots of people uh, offering uh, online payment services, merchant acquiring services, et cetera. What is it about the checkout product that sets you apart or makes you different, do you think? I think the, the easiest analogy, I love to do this one, is that, you know, how is, how is AWS different than an old server farm? They do both, they do the same thing. But fundamentally, uh, you know, AWS was built around enabling others to, you know, develop a better business and having faster time to market. We took the approach to build everything in the cloud as well, to build everything ourselves, which is, I guess, you know, unusual because there's not that many companies that really own both the technology and the financial licenses. And then we decided to gear everything towards enterprises by being super thorough and super granular on data, having the best auth rates. And at some point, there's an element of self-fulfilling prophecy because if you're helping merchants to be better at what they're doing, then people know about it. And this is how we basically, you know, we own now the fintech industry in Europe globally. We have, I mean, we have a hundred fintechs we were mentioning Grab before, it's Karim in the Middle East. We're doing like a lot of mobility now, including the largest companies globally. Uh, and the reality is that this is a, it's a you know, feature set that obviously works well with very modern forward thinking tech companies, but it also works with like, you know, companies that are in traditional retail and that are going through their digital transformation. So that core business of pay-in was really where we started the business. And then we moved on on what we call the world of connected finance, which is very much about moving money in a business and outside of a business. When you look at a company like ByteDance, for instance, they take payments and then they play influencers. And I think like this is there is a lot of value that can be created there because again, if people if you help people accept the payments globally, helping them paying those you know pay, doing the payouts globally is an equally hard challenge to solve. And if you can do that through a single platform, this is where we're putting a lot of energy right now. Really, I think historically it was called transactional banking. We call it, you know, connected finance because it's basically right. offering a single point of contact to forward-thinking companies to do all their payments. You can go further there, you know, down the road there, which is like empowering platforms, uh, which is something we've done. I was mentioning Klarna. Klarna has 60,000 submerchants. And so basically being a helping a Klarna to onboard those submerchants to do that effectively, put them on the rails of Visa and MasterCard is really where we're spending also a lot of our energy which is basically now enabling the marketplaces and the payfax. And here you can think about a lot of use cases, typically for Grab with their drivers. And again, it's basically taking the big merchants, the small merchants, but always through an, an enterprise lens. So, so Guillaume, a lot of people talk about sort of hyper-local in payments, uh, but you've also just been talking about sort of a global uh, transactional banking layer. So let's break that down into two pieces. When you talk about hyper-local, what, what does it mean for, for checkout? Fundamentally, if you look through history, financial services were always like split between, you know, local players and global players. So I think that there's a very strong local element to financial services. Uh, you could look in Singapore, for instance, a UOB or a DBS, they know exactly how to sell to Singaporeans to build their history there. And I think that for us, we've always taken the approach to be a global company because we connect to the major network, but at the same time, uh, connect into like the, the local flavors of each country. In Singapore, it would be, for instance, like Enets. You know, in China, Alipay, WeChat Pay, Union Pay. And I think like being able to tailor your message to a local market, but at the same time offer them the benefit of global technology is really important. And we don't do this just as a marketing narrative. If you look at how our people are split around the world, uh, these 950 plus employees that we have right now are across 14 uh, offices. And we really grow in each region, you know, kind of equally. Uh, you know, we've the Singapore office, I think now is 50 to 60 people. Uh, things keep increasing, you know, in every single region. And we we empower the regions to make their decisions. I think that this is probably the point that I want to stress out is that the Singapore uh, office has the ability to sell the Singapore market in the way they want, both from a marketing and product perspective, they can tailor to the, to the market locally, and they don't report to a UK office that is making decisions on their behalf. And, and 
I mean, lots of companies over the years have said we are global and local at the same time. But many of those built their company through M&A. They bought local players, et cetera. You're, you're doing it all yourselves, i.e. you're building out country by country, region by region, regulation by regulation, et cetera. What do you think that gives you as an advantage versus some of these historic players who have built, built their global and local presence through m and I mean, M&A is always tempting because obviously it's a way to build incremental revenue, but it's something that we fundamentally disagree with because this is why, you know, people ended up with a core product. Uh, M&A is value accretive for a shareholder. You make him a lot of money and good returns, but it's not value accretive from a product perspective because fundamentally you end up with a product that is like a Hydra with nine heads. You know, you lose the coherence, you have different platforms that don't talk to each other properly. And ultimately you go back to, to square one, which is why do people don't do payments properly? Because if you look at the biggest payment companies globally, they were mostly all built through M&A, you know? And I think like this is something that we took the approach. I'm a 39 year old person. Uh, you know, most of my, my company is young. We have a, a 20 year mission. This is how we talk at the all hands and better do things properly, doing all the steps one by one on your own technology. This way, obviously you can customize that technology. You can change it, evolve it for what is the dynamic nature of payments um, and stay away from M&A. Uh, as a way to add revenue or add geographies. We, we like M&A, but more from an IT higher perspective. We've bought two companies in that respect this year already, uh, pin payments in Australia and uh, process out in France. And I think like, you know, uh, we're a tech first company. So when we see like really good engineers, uh, the IT hire is always like, you know, a, an option that we would consider. Um, the company is only as good as its people and it's something I really believe in. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of good fintech companies out there and, and we respect everyone. We'll come back to geography in one second, Guillaume, but I, I, I think it's always interesting to ask the question, you know, you're, you're a fintech company, as you said, uh, and that is a combination of fin and tech. And so you've talked a lot about tech. Maybe just spend a minute just talking about how you think about fin, i.e. the financial services. And in that context, really what I mean is your relationship with regulators uh, in key markets. So, I mean, we're a regulated company today in the UK, France, Singapore, Hong Kong, Brazil, uh, and adding many more. Um, the reality is that the financial services directive in Europe, the PSD1, is what basically triggered everything. It gave the opportunity to non-banks to go into the business of payments. I think that this, when we look in hindsight, you know, 10 years later, it created huge opportunity and huge innovation in the market because it allows traditionally non-banks to start offering financial services. Uh, and create value for the end user, because I think it, the question is always like value for the end user. Mass today is very active in Singapore. We're very happy to be in Singapore. That's why we chose Singapore to basically run our Southeast uh, Asia operations, because we have a regulator who is like embracing technology, embracing innovation. And I think that this for us is very important. Uh, you know, there is a, I really think, and this is something I said on my own hands meeting, we're still at chapter zero. I mean, the, the innovation that is coming in financial services is really going to change the world people are going to consume. When I look at my kids just on how they behave with the TikTok, as an example, I can tell you that these people will not go into a branch. Uh, and I think like, you know, uh, having regulators that, you know, understand um, the value that can be created in fintech and at the same time defend their market properly by making sure that there is only good operators, I think is very important. And when I see typically mass awarding the digital banks, I think this is very exciting for the future. I'm an optimist as an entrepreneur, and I think it's, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm very excited for what can be done in the years to come in jurisdictions like Singapore. We've touched a little bit on geography, but let's go, go one level deeper. We'll obviously come back to Asia in a second because clearly uh, uh, it's a Singapore FinTech Festival. But let's talk, first of all, just about how you're allocating checkouts, time and resources around the world. What are the, the markets that are most interesting to you right now as to how you develop, let's say, the next one, two, three, four years? I'm a CEO that loves the what I call the napkin test. So it's about being able to make very simple rules that everyone can understand because mission and vision is very important. We took an approach that we wanted to be able to trade in all G20 countries. And then we wanted to be able to trade in every single country with 100 million people and above because the rules of big numbers apply in financial services. And if you have a big population, even if they're behind in terms of digital payment adoption, things only go into one direction, which is, you know, offline is moving to online and there's more transactions. So that's the, that was the checkout napkin test. Uh, now, if I you know, zoom in on Asia, Singapore is a very big market because obviously you get you know, access to companies that are not only in Singapore, thinking typically of a grab who operates in Singapore, but then operates in a lot of other regions. Um, we have right now, so uh, endeavors, active endeavors uh, with regulators in Asia, in Japan, in the Philippines, in Thailand. So these are the three countries that we're pursuing. And I will put India as well, though it's debatable if it's Southeast Asia, yes or no. 
Uh, so these are the four countries that we're you know, pursuing right now. We didn't do Vietnam on this batch. I think Vietnam will come more in 2022 or 2023 uh, for us. Um, what Asia has that is really formidable is that the, there's a very young population that is very phone savvy, very technology savvy, and it creates a lot of opportunity because it's very fragmented. And you know the product that you were raising before, the quality of our product is to basically unify the fragmentation. When you, when you look at very big merchants, they don't want to connect into 50 different wallets. You know, they want to connect in a single API. They want to have all the payment methods through that API, a single reconciliation, a single payments, having very granular data. So basically being able to understand who is paying what, you know, how and when. And for instance, if I have a user who's both on Visa MasterCard and at the same time on WeChat Pay, what is his favorite payment method? So I can offer him the right payment method when he comes back to my store. And fundamentally, I think like this is where we're excited about Asia. I mean, it's a you know, it's a it's a very dynamic area, and there is opportunity in, in dynamic uh, areas. And do you think, Guillaume, that 2021 uh, versus 2020 will see as much growth uh, because of continued adoption of Internet of Payments, or do you think 2020 will outperform 2021 in terms of relative growth just because of COVID and, and the move to sort of away from offline and onto online? So we're growing so fast at the moment that it's difficult for me to basically, uh, you know, make an opinion on, on the broader industry because, I mean, we've tripled transactions from 2018 to 2019. We tripled transactions from 2019 to 2020. We're doing billions of transactions right now and we're probably going to triple again next year. And I think like this is just a, by definition, when you serve the biggest merchants, they're growing by themselves and you're growing into their share of wallet. Um, one thing I do believe and one thing we've seen through the data in our merchants is that the hike, I mean, this big step that basically happened in Q2 is not going back. So I think like when people, and we're talking about user experience and financial services, but it's the same thing in food delivery. It's the same thing in mobility. When you're able to move somebody through a better user experience online, you just change a behavior. And when that behavior has changed, there's very few reasons to go back to the old behavior that very most of the time was like, you know, clunky. If I look at my mom, for instance, you know, she's not very good with the internet, despite having a son who is a tech CEO. But when she understands something, then she's like, hey, I mean, she's not going to go back to ordering her groceries and going into the store anymore. And I think like this is this change in behavior is what we're actually seeing now. We're, we're fast forward like three to five years in the future. And, you know, it's very unfortunate what happened with COVID, but these behaviors are not going to change. So to answer your question, I think 2021 will be another very strong year for e-commerce and online payments in general, uh, because a lot of people are seeing the opportunity and the market is very active at the moment. Guillaume, okay, that's a very positive way to finish the, the, the conversation. So thank you very much, Guillaume, for taking the time. Thank you to the Singapore FinTech Festival for hosting us. And uh, hopefully the entire conference is a success and enjoyable for all the participants. Thank you, Guillaume. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much, Singapore FinTech, FinTech Festival. With Europe's FinTech companies dominating, one can only wonder what other financial innovations will come from the region. Thanks very much to Guillaume and to Tom for that session.